Huh? She's not in town. Oh, I don't know. But she's in Disney right now. She's yeah, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you're here joining us for worship this morning. That's what we're here to do, right? To worship the Lord. Let's stand together and sing praises to His name. Y'all can be seated. I got some announcements I'm going to go over with y'all this morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to Hebron Baptist Church where we exist to serve God, or to love God, love people, and make disciples. I got it. Don't worry. All right. I got the major statement. All right. I'll get yelled at. I'm just kidding. It's on the shirt. My wife's right there. All right. All I had to do was look. She had me, she had me set up correctly and everything, and I missed it. I got it, though. All right. Don't worry. 
Um, I'm Corey McKinney. I have the absolute honor to serve as associate pastor and student pastor here, um, and it's a joy uh, to be up here. My family and I got to move um, up here uh, permanently um, a few weeks ago, had a, had a great group of guys that came and helped us, some ladies who have poured into our home and helped us decorate and get everything set up and unpack the millions and millions of boxes that we've had to unpack. It's been unbelievable. So I just want to thank y'all first, uh, first and foremost from for me and my wife personally, uh, thank y'all so much for loving on our family so well and for helping us get here. Um, we love it. We love being here in Denham Springs, and we love serving you guys in a full-time capacity. Look, I want to point to the chair in front of you. You should see a Connect card uh, that's sitting there. If you're a guest or you've been with us a few weeks and you're interested about things that are going on uh, in the church or you need some prayer, um, even if you're not a guest and you need prayer for something, please fill that card out. We'll take up offering in just a, a little while after uh, we get done with our songs. And uh, you can drop that card off in the offering plate, uh, and that will make its way to the uh, right people. We'll pray over those. Um, if you want more information about what's going on in the church, we can get you signed up on the email list. It's just a good way for us to make a point of contact with you. So if you're a guest with us this morning, please fill that out for us. Um, I've got some things I want to let y'all know about. Men's ministry has a lot going on, specifically next Saturday, February 10th. Um, at 8 a.m., there's breakfast, right? So if you're a guy in the church of any age, and I mean any age, uh, it was a beautiful thing last week. Uh, it was Tuesday night. We had men's ministry, and we were in there, and there were kids, right? There were kids, and they get to see men who are older who have been living in the faith for a long time, guys like me uh, who, have, who have been in it for, for just a short while, and then we have these, these young boys that were in there as well. It was so cool to just see the generations of believers there in the room. So if it's something that you want to be a part of as a man, I just, I just encourage you, come show up, all right? The breakfast is going to be great. It'll be at 8 a.m., um, and on the same day, at 6 p.m., we have the Night of Testimony, um, we have guest speakers Charlie and Christy Robinson, and they will be here sharing their testimony of what God has done in their life. It'll be at the CAC. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, please, 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 please sign up in the back uh, in the foyer when you walk out on your left past the Welcome Center. Uh, there's a sheet where you can sign up to be a part of that. I'd like to remind you as well, for those of you who are coming, this is a, uh, there will be a fundraiser taken up at the end and offering. Our students will be serving, so you'll, there'll be a dinner that's provided. It's gumbo and potato salad is what I'm told. Um, and our youth will be in charge of serving that to you uh, and making sure that everything flows well. And part of that is there will be a love offering taken up at the end to support our youth ministry and uh, helping them get to camp and helping them uh, pay for other expenses as well so that the burden is not entirely on them and their families to provide for everything. So if that's something that you would like to help out with, just bring some, bring some cash, whatever loose change you got laying around. We'll take pennies if you got them. All right, we will. Well, all right, so if you could uh, bring that as we take up that love offering there at the end. Um, following that very next week, so not Sunday the 11th, so not the one that's coming up, but the one after that, we have the pie auction. That is another big fundraiser for the students, so we're hitting you all back to back, okay, but just bear with us. Uh, the pie auction is an incredible event. I got to be a part of it for the first time last year, and I absolutely loved it. All right, if it's something that you've never been a part, I've been a part of, please sign up and come. If you want to provide a pie to be auctioned off, you can sign up in the back as well in the same place for the night of testimony signups. It's back there in the foyer. Please sign up. Bring as many as you want. There is no no number limit. Okay. If there's any extras left over, I just live right there. Okay. I'll take them home. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Women's ministry meets March 9th. Uh, if you want more info about how to join in the women's ministry or how to be a part of that, uh, you can reach out to Ms. Janice, uh, and she'll give you some more info on that as well. We'll be doing a prayer walk through the neighborhoods on March 16th, so mark your calendars for that. We'll meet here at 9 a.m. for worship, and then from there, we'll go out into various neighborhoods. There are multiple people who are going to be leading various groups into different neighborhoods to go and prayer walk, and this is all it's going to be. We're going to be walking uh, through neighborhoods and knocking on doors, telling people who we are, and asking how we can pray for them. And if it proceeds into a gospel conversation, then praise the Lord. But if not, then we are at least praying for our community and letting them know that not only do we exist, but we care for them. Right? We're going out to the masses. It's just a cool outreach opportunity. So if that's something that you're interested in, you want to be a part of, you won't be alone. Okay, there will be a group that's going with you, right? We're not going to make you go up to the door by yourself. You'll have somebody with you if that's something that makes you nervous, uh, right? And so it'll be a really, really cool opportunity to be able to do something that maybe you've never done before. So please come and be a part of that. Once we're done with that, right, we'll leave here after that worship service. We'll go and do that. We'll come back here and meet up for lunch. 
And then we'll just have a time to, to talk testimony. What happened? What did God show us? What did he do? Right? Did anybody give their life to the Lord? It'll be a really cool time to kind of reflect on the areas that we went to and what we were able to do and how we were able to pray for people. So I cannot emphasize this enough. March the 16th, it's the prayer walk for the neighborhoods. Please come be a part of that, okay? All right. Let me pray for us, and uh, we'll get back into worship. God, thank you so much for this morning, Lord. Thank you for everything that you are doing for us, God, and everything that you are doing for this community, this body of believers here at Hebron. Father, as we continue to honor you and worship, God, and sing your praises and about your glory, or would you continue to fill our hearts with your word, Father, as we learn it through song, through your message from Brother Travis, God, and as we submit to you in prayer. Lord, if there's anything on our hearts tonight, God, or today, God, strongholds in our lives that need to be submitted before you, Father, sin that needs to be repented of, Lord, would you stir us in affection towards you to come and do that. God, we love you and we praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue in worship? Easy to 
this morning comes from Psalm 34. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. The Father worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Let us magnify the Lord together this morning and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. cry out to worship whose glory taught the stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing but this joy is mine with a thousand hallelujahs we magnify Magnify your name, you alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Who else would die for our redemption?
Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. this time in our worship service where we continue to worship God through tithes and offerings, I want to remind you that this is a a time for you to spend in prayer with God. And and as you give, that you would give with a cheerful heart. Um, Also, I want to remind you that there's always a tendency when the plate is passed to feel a sense of obligation or, yeah, you know, you want to, you want to empty your pockets or something. This is a time for you to worship God through tithes and offerings. Let me read to you what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly 
or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is a time for us to give back. We know that God owns everything and all that we have is a gift from him and we're called to be good stewards of that and we give back in response to worship of who he is and what he's done for us. This is our time to worship God through tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you are, all that you've done and all that you give us. Lord, we're called to be good stewards of that and it's during this time, Lord, that we we give back. We worship you through tithes and offerings. And God, I pray that each heart who gives this morning would do so in a cheerful way, knowing, Lord, that it's, it's our aim to please you. As we continue to worship this morning, Jesus, may you be glorified. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning once again. We are back in the book of Colossians this morning. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Give you a recap. We've, we've picked up, uh, picking back up Colossians today, but it's been a couple of months since we've been in the book of Colossians. We took a break during Christmas to walk through some Christmas stories, and then in January we had an emphasis on prayer. And then towards the end of January, we talked about our mission statement and fleshed that out, what it means to love God, love people, and make disciples. And so February, we're kicking back into the book of Colossians. And I remind you, the book of Colossians give you sort of a, a general recap. Chapters 1 and 2 specifically deal with some doctrine, some theological issues that Paul was addressing specifically. Uh, the Colossians were battling heresy. There were people saying that Jesus wasn't fully God and fully man. And so Paul is reminding them of who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. He was also uh, reminding them, rebuking them, that Jesus did in fact physically come in bodily form. There were uh, heresies going around saying that he was a spirit or some type of ghost. He really didn't come in the flesh. And so Paul is reminding the Colossian believers of who Jesus is. And so chapters 1 and 2 specifically deal with a theological um, understanding, theological 
a heresy that were taking place in Colossians. And then we get into chapter 3. This is where it gets into the more practical, um, so to speak. Um, well, Paul is sort of saying, well, because of this truth, in light of that, this is how we should therefore live. If you read a lot of Paul's writings, he does that. He deals first with some theological issues, heresy, bringing in truth, and then he goes into more practical. How do you live out that truth? Romans chapters 1 through 11 is an incredible treatise of theological understanding that Paul gives us. And then in chapter 12, he says, therefore, because of all of this, here's how you are to live. And so today in chapter 3, we get to one of those therefores. In light of who Jesus is and who we are in him, what does this mean for you and I? Well, if you read with me in chapter 3, verse 1, <clears throat> Paul writes and says, If, then, you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Pray with me. Father, we thank you so much to gather here this morning to hear your word proclaimed. And we ask, God, that you would speak. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in chapter 1, Paul gives us a conditional statement starting in verse 1. If you are in Christ. This is a conditional statement. If you have called on the name of the Lord and you are following Jesus... He then gives us some implications, some commands on how we are to live. But before we get into those commands, I want us to understand who exactly we are in Christ. The theological under the term we can use is union with Christ. It's much more than just being saved. It's what happens when someone places their faith in Christ. The moment someone turns from their sin and trusts in Jesus, trusts in Jesus and calls upon the name of the Lord, there are a few things that take place and they are immediate. One, the person who places their faith in Christ, they are justified before a holy God. That word justified means to be made right or to be declared righteous. You and I who are in Christ, we are declared right before God. Whereas before, we stood condemned. But because of our faith in Christ, we are now justified by the blood of Jesus. And so here's what took place for you when you placed your faith in Jesus. You were guilty. You stood condemned before a holy and righteous God. But because of faith in Christ, you are forgiven and justified before God. That means the righteousness of Christ is now imputed into you are on you, so to speak. That's the message of the gospel, the good news, is that we were sinners, condemned, but because of Christ, we now stand forgiven and justified. That happens immediately. You don't earn justification. The moment someone places their faith in Christ, they are justified before a holy and righteous God. Justification happens immediately. There's another word, theological word, that uh, is used called sanctification. This is a process of the Holy Spirit coming into the believer's life and working through other believers, through the world, through whatever means possible, especially, most importantly, through the Word of God to conform us into the image of what we've already been declared to be. Righteous. Jesus. right? His righteousness. It's imputed. It's on us. So when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ, the Holy Spirit's role now in sanctification is to come alongside that believer and to begin to purge and, and remove the dross away from a believer's life so that they could be conformed into the image of what they're declared to be, which is Jesus. And Romans chapter 8, 29 says we were predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's a process. In fact, it's a lifelong process. You and I... Do not attain to this, uh, the, the end goal of becoming righteous like this. Now, before God, we are declared righteous, but the Holy Spirit comes along in our lives to conform us into this 
image. That's a lifelong process. It's a learning process. Um, <clears throat> I know it's also a painful process where God comes and reveals things in our lives that are not of him, calls us to repent, to turn. Uh, and that's, unfortunately, is something you and I are always going to walk through in this life. So that process begins the moment we cry out to the Lord. Thirdly, instantaneously, when we cry out to Jesus, we are adopted into the family of God. Adoption. This is what takes place when somebody turns to Jesus. You now become a son or a daughter in the eyes of God. This is beautiful where God turns blasphemers, wretch, wretches, people who were enemies of God, and turns them into sons or daughters. And fourthly, which is something that we're experiencing, but we will not fully understand or experience, fully experience it until Christ comes back or we leave this world, is glorification. Justification, sanctification, adoption, and glorification. One day, you and I will have a new body, a resurrected body, where there be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow. All that is going to be gone, and we will be glorified with Jesus. I can't tell you, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. My back's been killing me all week, all right? And, and I'm thinking about, man, one day, I'm not going to have this back pain anymore. Uh, and you're probably thinking, I'm, I know I'm 35, and uh, you got back pain? Yeah, my back feels like it's 53. Um, but I can't wait till that day. And that's what we look forward to as believers, we look forward to that day where, where Christ comes back and makes all things new. If you've lived long enough in this world, then you've experienced the pain and suffering that this world can bring. In fact, this past week, our family has gone through a lot of this pain and suffering. Uh, could be, always could be worse. Megan was in the hospital last weekend. Friday got admitted. Came home Sunday morning. Uh, we're, we're in constant um, Fear that the baby decides to come at any moment and that baby needs to cook a little bit longer. <clears throat> we still don't know if it's a boy or girl because she wants to wait. I, I am too. That's okay. And then Monday night, Sadie Ruth had a seizure. We, we've, we've been battling with insurance and uh, Walgreens on trying to get her medicine. So she went a week without her medicine. And the day before she was getting her medicine... She had a seizure. I knew that was going to happen. For some reason, I just knew that it was going to happen. And, and I tell you, God's goodness, even in that moment, that Monday night, I was planning to go to a soccer game uh, in Dutchtown for the, the district championship. And I just felt like I needed to stay home. I was going to New Orleans, planning to go to New Orleans that Tuesday to meet with a professor about some things. And I decided to stay home, cook dinner, and just hang out with, with the family, and uh, Sadie Ruth was getting ready for bed, and she was on the ground. We were looking at baby pictures of me, and, uh, and we were just amazed how much Jonathan and I look alike, and then I picked her up, rolled her on the bed to uh, wrestle with her, and um, she seized up and went into a seizure. I'll be honest with you, I've never seen one like this, but it was a normal one. She turned purple. I thought she was going to die. I panicked. Megan did it. Usually one of us panics and the other one is like calm, cool, collected in that moment. Like, hey, go do this. Go do that. I was panicking. And I was praying the whole time, Jesus, please heal her right now. In the name of Jesus, heal her. I was praying and trying to hold it all together. And when they left, went to the hospital, <clears throat> as soon as the door shut, I fell on my knees and I wept like a baby. I wept. And I just, the thought of that's the worst fear for a parent, is it not? The thought of that happening just broke me. And I began to cry out to the Lord, Jesus, where are you? I know you're here, but I need you. I need you right now in this moment. And as I uh, gathered some things, a friend came over and watched Jonathan was sleeping. I, as I was driving to the hospital, it was like the Lord just spoke 
ever so softly to me and reminded me of his goodness even in the darkness. He said, Travis, you were home for a reason. It happened in your arms. Not when she was walking, not when she was in the bathtub, God forbid, none of that. It was, it was the perfect scenario for that to happen was right in my arms for me to hold on to her and give her the space she needed to, to have that. In fact, when we reflect on all of the, the dark times in our lives, God has been faithful every single time, reminding us that he is with us, even in the darkness. But brothers and sisters, listen to me. There is coming a day when that will no longer be a thing. There's coming a day where there is no more miscarriages. There is no more cancer. There's no more death. There's no more dying. There's coming a day where you and I will be with God and he will be with us forever. Forever. No matter what you're going through, you need to understand this, that Jesus is with you. In fact, Paul would tell us in Romans, if God is for us, then who can be against us? This reveals to us that God is ever present in our time of need, and not just in our time of need, but but always with us. We don't worship a God who just created the world and said, have at it. Let's see what happens. He is intimately involved in all of our lives and he is calling us to walk with him. And even in the darkness, he shouts and reminds us of his goodness. Even in the darkness, he reminds us that he loves us and he cares for us. In fact, 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter calls believers to cast your anxieties, your burdens to the Lord because he cares for you. This is the God that we serve, and this is the Christ that we're, we're united to by faith. That's who you and I are in Jesus. We're sons and daughters. We're beloved by the Father. That's what Paul is getting at. He says, if you are in Christ, in Christ, if you have called on the name of the Lord, you are justified before a holy God, made, or excuse me, declared righteous, You have entered into this process of sanctification where the Holy Spirit comes alongside and begins to remove the things that are not of God to conform you into the image of Jesus. You're adopted. You're a child of the living God. And you and I are destined for glory. We're destined for glory. Paul is making this case all throughout Colossians. And in chapter 3, verse 1, he puts this conditional clause, if then you are in Christ, here's how you should live. I also want you to see something in a couple of different verses. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, Paul says, having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. And in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, Paul asks the question, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him and by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. This is where Paul is getting uh, at in chapter 3, verse 1. If then you are in Christ, here's how you should live. In fact, when we celebrate baptism, you'll notice that we sort of say the same thing every time someone gets baptized. There's a few questions we ask. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that, that you're forgiven and you'll rise? And there's a couple different questions you can ask. And as we baptize them, there's something we say. Upon your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with baptism in Christ, raised to walk in a newness of life. There's a reason for that. It it all ties into this union with Christ, this understanding of who we are in Christ. What does this mean? Paul is making the case that because of who we are in Christ and the picture that we have 
from baptism, you and I are new creations. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, the new has come. Baptism is a powerful picture of a spiritual reality. That as a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, the death of Jesus now becomes their death. The burial of Jesus becomes their burial. And the resurrection of Jesus becomes their resurrection. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in a newness of life. And here's where Paul says, because of who you are in Christ, here's what this means for you. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Because you and I are raised with Christ, we are now commanded to walk in a newness of life. Well, first we see, Paul says, to walk in this newness of life, we have to first seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is new motivations for the believer. If you're in Christ, you no longer have the same motivations that you had before Jesus. You now have new motivations You are called to seek the things that are above. Have new desires. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, All these things will be added to you. The Christian now is given a desire for Jesus and a new motivation for life. Well, what's this motivation? Simply to please the Father. Have you ever asked the question or been asked the question, Why do you do what you do? Well, before Christ, we did what was right in our eyes. We had our own ambitions and we lived for our own pleasure. But now, in Christ, we are called to walk in this newness of life and to have new motivations, new desires. Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. There's our motivation. Whatever you do. Notice he says, whatever Not some things, but whatever you do, you are called to work heartily for it, to please the Father. Fathers, your aim is to please God. Husbands, to please God. Mothers, wives, to please God. You say, well, even in my job, yes, even in your workplace, stay-at-home mother, your job is to please God in all that you do, wherever you work, a teacher, a coach, Your job is to please God. When I coach sports, I reminded my students that we're called to play for a higher purpose. It's not just playing a sport for the sake of playing a sport. We're called to play to the glory of God. And whatever you do in all things, do unto the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, that's new motivations. It's no longer to please ourselves, but to please our heavenly Father. Not only are we to have new motivations, we're also to have new mindsets. Paul writes and says, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And in verse 2, he says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. We're to have a new mindset. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul reminds us that you and I are called to take every thought captive to Christ. All of our thoughts are to be taken captive and say, is this pleasing to God? Now that's that's a battle, is it not? In fact, most of our battles are where? It's in our minds. This idea of taking every thought captive is, it really takes practice to, to ask yourself, well, where do these thoughts come from? Whenever we have anxious thoughts, we ask ourselves, where does this thought come from? Is this a lie? Is this fear? Is this from me? Well, God says that he takes care of the sparrows. Will he not take care of me? Well, God says that do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough to worry about itself. Do I, do I have that mindset? Do I take that, that thought captive and say, no, even though I'm fearful for what may come, God says don't worry, but leave it to him. That's taking, taking every thought captive, having a new mindset 
I'll be honest with you, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes practice, it takes time, it takes sanctification. It's a process to where we learn that we can trust God. In fact, every trial that Megan and I go through, where we look back and say, wow, God, God showed up. We didn't see it at the time, but he was there. We can trust him. We can, we can, we can come to him with our, our worries and our doubts and our fears, and he hears us, and he, he takes care of us. Even if it doesn't pan out the way we think it should, we know that he still hears and loves us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It's hard to think about these things sometimes when all you can think about is the what ifs. Anybody else been there before? What if, and usually we typically pick the worst possible scenario. It's not the second worst possible. It's usually the worst possible scenario, right? That they, they could, in a perfect storm, everything is going to align the proper way and it's going to be the worst situation, the worst scenario that you could ever conjure up and that's usually what we go to. But for the believer, our mindset comes in and says, even though, even, even though I feel like this, even though my thoughts are drifting to this, I'm going to come back to the word of God and say, well, wait a minute. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Well, wait a minute. If, if God took care of Abraham and Moses, took care of all these other people in Scripture and provided for them and protected them, And if God so clothes the grass today, if he takes care of the sparrows, will he not much more take care of us? This is what you and I desperately need, is to have a biblical understanding, a biblical worldview, with the lens of Scripture on our minds constantly, filtering everything that we go through, everything that we think, saying, well, wait a minute, is this of God? Is this of me or is this of the enemy? We know that there is only one who is true. There's only one who is right. You and I have to train our minds and our hearts to even put our own thoughts aside and say, I'm trusting God's promises despite what I feel. I've shared this story before, but it's fitting this morning when I became a believer in Christ, I, I suffered with anxiety for seven years. I still have some anxiety here and there, but for seven years, I mean, I had intense anxiety. I tried to get medicine. It didn't work. It made it worse. And it was like the Lord wanted me to go through this. That's hard to explain, but it was like the Lord was teaching me, uh, sort of like his thorn to Paul, teaching me to trust in him. And so for seven years, I had this crippling anxiety. I couldn't even go into uh, restaurants, and I just, my heart would start beating out of my chest, and I would have these fearful thoughts and uh, just thoughts of damnation, like I was being condemned. And as the years went on, the anxiety began to wade. I was learning to trust God more and more. And then almost seven years to the day that I was saved, I woke up in the middle of the night, heart beating out of my chest, sweat, heat flashes down my side, full-on anxiety attack, and a voice saying, it's over. You're going to hell. (laughs) I can't explain it. I can't explain it to you, but... It's what happened, and I'm sitting on the edge of the bed trying to breathe and heart beating out of my chest, and I feel like it's coming to the end, and I remember Megan woke up, she's like, what's wrong? And I'm just like telling her what's happening. I I can't calm down. I'm trying to do the breathing exercise, all of that, and this voice is coming on saying, it's over, you're dead, you're going to hell, it's over, you're condemned. I've been a youth pastor preaching the gospel that Jesus can save and that uh, once saved, always saved, all these things. Do you think that I'll have some assurance, right? No, in the moment, 
the feelings were so real. I felt as if hell was opening up and I was falling in it right then. And all I knew to do was open my Bible. I opened it to Romans chapter 10, where Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I read that passage out loud and I said, God, I know what I'm feeling. I know what these thoughts are telling me, but this is what your word says and this is what I'm trusting. If I'm going to perish, I'm going to perish holding on to your word, which is an oxymoron. And almost immediately after I prayed that, this overwhelming peace came upon me. (laughs) And I was angry. I was angry. I said, God, you could have taught me that in a year. Not seven. But God revealed something to me in that moment. Saying, Travis, I was teaching you to trust me. I was teaching you to trust me. And brothers and sisters, I can't tell you how many times I've been able to sit with people and say, I know what you're going through. But listen to what God says. Who are you going to trust? Your thoughts or his word? And this is what you and I are called to do, is to train our minds to trust in the word of God despite all of that going on around us. Despite our, even our own feelings and our own thoughts, we're to take God's word as supremacy and say, no, I know what I'm thinking, I know what I'm feeling, but this is what the word of God says and this is what I'm standing on. And what you'll find, here's what you'll find. God is faithful and his word is true. God is faithful and his word is true. This is what you and I are called to do, to trust in him, to have these new motivations, to be heavenly minded in all things. Now, I want to address something. There is a saying, and this is, I'm, I'm kind of going on a, uh, a purposeful uh, trail here, or a rabbit trail. This is a purposeful rabbit trail. I get on those a lot. But this is a purposeful one. I want to talk about this saying. You ever heard the saying, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good? Anybody ever heard that before? Wow, I'm the only person? Okay. Well, you might hear it one day, so I'm just going to address it anyways. It's a lie. It's a lie. You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. In fact, Oliver Holmes is the one that coined that. But I'm going to have to, and forgive me, I'm going to call out the great Johnny Cash here in 1977. He wrote a song called, You're So, uh, You're you're, you're No Earthly Earthly Good is the song title. And it goes, you're shining your light and shine it you should, but you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I love Johnny Cash, but he's wrong on this. I get the understanding, right? There's people who are are so, you know, uh, spiritual that when it comes to practical things on earth, they're just, they just don't get it. They're like, they're, they over-spiritualize everything. That's not what Paul is getting at for us to be heavenly minded at all. In fact, let me read to you what one commentator says. Being heavenly minded does not result in isolating oneself from the world. Think of monks. Ignoring contemporary issues or declining to be involved. Just the opposite. Being heavenly minded results in attempting to please God who has given us work to do in this world. What does that mean for you and I? It means that as we go to our workplaces, as we go to school, as we go to uh, serve our families, we're to be heavenly minded. We're to have heavenly motivations and a heavenly mindset in all that we do. C.S. Lewis says this, if you read history, you will find that Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. (laughs) I think about in in 1785, William Wilberforce had a spiritual conversion and decided that he wanted to leave parliament and become a life and take the life of a minister. He met with a pastor by the name of John Newton. You might be familiar with the name John Newton. Uh, He wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace, It's also, uh, he passed through the church that we got to visit in London. And as we closed out our tour of these great preachers, we all gathered together and sung the first line of Amazing Grace in this, uh, this, this 
historic church that John Newton pastored. William, William Wilberforce met with John Newton and said, hey, what should I do? And Newton convinced him to stay in Parliament for the glory of God. Newton, who himself was a former slave ship captain, recounted not just to Wilberforce but also to a task force the horrors of the slave trade. And in 1807, because of William Wilberforce's push, the British Parliament made it illegal for British ships to transport slaves and for British colonies to import them. And in 1838, slavery would be abolished completely. Do you think, what would have happened if William Wilberforce decided to say, hey, you know what? I'm getting spiritual here. I'm going to become a minister. No. He continued where he was at being heavenly minded. And he made an impact in this world that is continued, continuing to be talked about today. If we had enough time, we could speak about all the Christian men and women who are so heavenly minded and how they changed and impacted this world for the better. Men like George Mueller, who was known for his dependence upon God. Let me read you this article about George Mueller. Mueller was uh, famous for being a pastor, but also for opening up orphanages all throughout Europe. And in one morning, the house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller, the children are dressed and ready for school, but there is no food for them to eat. George asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. He thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide food for the children as he always did. Within minutes, a baker knocked on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I couldn't sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring them in. Soon there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage and the milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. So he asked George if they could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 cans of milk and it was just enough for 300 thirsty children. Mueller was famous for what he would tell the children as they got ready to leave. He would put a Bible in their right hand and a coin in the other. And he would tell them, if you would hold on to what's in your right hand, God will always make sure you have something in the left. We could mention Lottie Moon, 32 years old, turned down marriage and pros- prosperity to go and serve people in China who would reject her, mostly reject her. She labored there for years. She has a famous quote. She says, why should we not do something that will prove that we are really earnest in claiming to be followers of him who, though he was rich for our sake, became poor. We could speak of John and Molly Wells. You don't know who they are. I served with them in Florida. John was a regional manager at Publix. Molly was a, a nurse who was in management. And both of them felt the call to leave everything. Four children who were mostly grown at the time, to leave everything and move to serve the people of Mangochi and Malawi, Africa. People thought they were crazy. People still think they're crazy. To give up the comforts and the the things that we hold on dearly here, to go and serve those less fortunate. But you know what all these people have in common? They were all heavenly minded. They thought more about the world that is coming than the world here. And because of that, it motivated them, gave them a new mindset to make a difference here in this world. What would that look like in your life? What would it look like if you took seriously your relationship with God? And this understanding that you have a new motivation, a new mindset, how would that change your family? How would that change your workplace? How would that change how you lived your life? What motivates you? What occupies your thoughts? 
Let me tell you this. Because of our faith in Jesus, because we are united to him, this means that our old self has died and the new self now lives for him who died for us. This brings in new motivations and new desires. And as Shane Pruitt said, only a false version of Christianity teaches that as long as you believe in God, you can live however you want to live. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, then we are called to take on a new mindset and have new motivations. We're to be so heavenly minded that we impact and change this world, our family, our workplace, all those people we come in contact with. That's the call that you and I have. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, of who we are in you. God, we're saved by grace through faith, by trusting in you. You've called us to walk in a newness of life to have a new mindset, to have new motivations, Lord, to live for you and not for this present world. And God, as we do what you commanded us to do, to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, as we do that, we become more concerned about the lost and dying around us. We become more concerned about the homeless and the orphan, the widow, we become more concerned with those in need. Father, my prayer for us this morning is that you would strip away our pride. God, and if it means taking away our comfort so that we can see you clearly, do it. Help us understand who we are and what it means for us to walk in this newness of life. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as you stand with us to continue to worship, uh, invitation for you this morning is simply this. If you don't know Christ, you've never called on his name, today's the day of salvation that you would come and place your faith in him. You can come. I'd love to talk with you about what that means to follow Jesus and trust in him. If you need prayer, I'd love to pray for you. Maybe some of you this morning have been pursuing something other than the kingdom of God. Maybe your ambitions have been your own ambitions. You've placed you first. And you need to repent. You need to move Jesus, excuse me, yes, move Jesus to the throne of your heart and remove whatever's occupying the throne your heart this morning. I encourage you to do that. I'd love to pray with you, talk with you about what that means this morning. Let's worship.
of death is gone for we carry his life in our you with this last thought. God loves us so much that he is not willing to let us be where we are spiritually. He loves us so much and wants to, desires us to be conformed into his image that he, he would send trials. He would send joy. He would send all these things to conform us after his image. This is a beautiful picture of what God wants to do in every single one of our lives is to conform us after the image of the Son. This is a process. This is slow. This takes time. This is just being consistent as God continues to work in and through us. But God loves us so much that he is not willing to let us just be who we are. He wants to change us and mold us after his image for his glory. Amen? Amen. I encourage you, to dig in this journey. Dig in and, and, and allow God to do his work in and through you. All right. Corey's going to pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord. We thank you for what you have done for us through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God, for those who have placed their faith in him. Lord, we have, we have been justified God, and as we live this life, you are sanctifying us. You have adopted, adopted us as sons and daughters. Father, and one day we will know what glorified means. God, that we will be with you for eternity, Lord. And like you say in Revelation, God, you'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more pain. There will be no more death. There will be nothing more but just you and love and heavenly peace. Father, as we seek that this morning in our lives, God, as we go out into a world that doesn't know that, God, that doesn't know the great joy that is found in your word, Lord, and in our relationship with you, God, may you light a fire in our hearts to share your word with those around us who so desperately need us. God, as we walk into the darkness, allow us to be beacons of hope. We ask all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Still